um, to welcome you and then we'll continue with the rest of the of the program. So um, Grace, please go ahead. Hello all, uh, I hope that you're doing well. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event, which has been organized by SWEN. SWEN stands for South Sudan Women's Empowerment Network. It is a non-governmental organization that was founded in 2005 by Lillian Rizik, and it focuses on empowering women in South Sudan. Today's event has also been organized in collaboration with the Global Women's Institute at the George Washington University and with support from the Kroc Institute of Justice and Peace at the University of San Diego. As I start off with my introductory remarks, please allow me to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Dr. Grace Juan Soma. I am a South Sudanese woman, a member of South Sudan Women Intellectual Forum, and a pediatrician by profession. I feel so privileged and honored to be making today's introductory remarks. Today, we have convened as women peacemakers from various countries like Israel, US, Pakistan, and South Sudan. We also have international peace funders like the Open Society Initiative. We have UN agencies like UN Women. We have global partners like USAID. We have activists, researchers, academics, and we have governments like the government of Canada and our very own government, the Republic of South Sudan. We are here to deliberate on ending the cycle of violence and support for women civil society organizations in South Sudan. So why is the discussion on ending violence against women so important? Well, women are a vital social fabric of any society and violence against women not only has negative consequences for the women, but also for their children, their families, their communities, and their countries at large. In fact, the costs of tackling violence against women are so expensive and it trickles down to different sectors, you know, healthcare, education, justice, and the impact can be felt on various fronts, such as the security, the economic, and the developmental fronts. And despite the progress that has been made, the work on ending violence against women is still far from being done. Right now, as the world focuses all its energies on the current pandemic, there is a shadow pandemic that is lingering on in the background, and this is violence against women. In conflict-affected environments like South Sudan, cases of violence against women have been on the rise, especially during this period of the pandemic. In fact, uh, this week, the Honorable uh, Minister for gender, child, and social development, that is Honorable Aya Benjamin Warile, was in the press and she was talking about the fact that cases of gender-based violence have been on the increase during the pandemic. And in fact, uh, cases of rape against women have been on the rise. What is sad about the situation is that the perpetrators of these acts of violence against women are still going on unpunished. And we're yet to see greater implementation of laws, policies, and services that protect women and girls against violence. But all is not gloom because this is where women's civil society organizations come into play. You see, women's civil society organizations are uniquely placed to tackle violence against women and girls because women and local women-led civil society organizations, they understand the cultural context of the survivors of violence. They're able to navigate cultural, geographic, and political barriers. And they do share in this women's lived experiences because they are women themselves. This makes them relatable and effective agents of social change. Women-led civil society organizations in South Sudan operate under challenging conditions where you find that amenities like good transport and communication, running water, electricity, and things like internet, which we are using for today's meeting, are just luxuries. And to be able to support women civil society organizations to conduct their work effectively, we need more funding, we need more infrastructural and more capacity building support. I'm not going to talk much about this because today we shall be hearing firsthand from women civil society leaders in South Sudan who are leading, creating, and sustaining social movements 
that are responding to violence against women. Also joining us today are faculty members from various universities in the US who have been doing research from, against, on violence against women and most notable being researched by Dr. Mary Ellsberg, who is the director of global, the Global Women's Institute at George Washington University. It is my hope that as we listen to the speakers and panelists today, we can all learn from the best practices shared. We can celebrate their successes. We can discover new opportunities and we can overcome challenges that will eventually contribute to ending the cycle of violence against women. As I conclude, I would like to welcome you all once again. Thank you so much for listening. And I will now invite Ms. Deviani Dixit, the Global Women's Institute Senior Research Associate, to take us through the logistical aspects of today's event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grace, for your wonderful um, welcome. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending this webinar. As Dr. Grace mentioned, my name is Deviani Dixit, and I'm a senior research associate at the Global Women's Institute. So before we continue hearing from many of the wonderful speakers and panelists, I'd like to explain the logistics of this webinar and share a few points for a smooth experience. Since we have um, so many attendees, um, your audio and video are disabled to ensure that we have good connection, um, but you're welcome to ask questions in the Q&A box that you can find at the bottom center area of your screen. So if you look right at the bottom, you'll see a menu and there'll be something that says Q&A. Um, as different speakers and panelists present, please feel free to send questions for the Q&A session um, that we will hold in the last 30 minutes of this event. Um, please note that we will not be able to address all of your questions during the Q&A, but we will do our best to collect the questions and group them. Um, and the speakers and panel, panelists will then answer these questions once the presentation is over and we open up for Q&A. Um, I would recommend uh, waiting for some of the speakers to present and panelists to talk because some of your questions might indeed get answered throughout the, um, throughout the event as well. So um, towards the end, when we open up for Q&A is a great time to send some of your questions. Um, the chat function is not for Q&A and we've actually disabled this for you. Um, if you have an issue, you can directly write to one of us through the chat function. Um, and also please note that we are recording this presentation and it will be available um, on our Global Women's Institute webpage. It's also currently live on the SWEN Facebook page. So if you have any colleagues who'd like to tune in, please let them know. Um, and finally, um, Lily, next please. Finally, um, the Croc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego invite you to take part in a survey for their year long study called Investing in Equity, Creating Equitable Funding for Local Women Peace Builders. Um, please find the links to this survey in the chat in the chat box that my colleague Skylar will be sending out. Um, and please note that there are two links. One is for women peace builders. So if you identify as a peace builder, please take this survey. The other one is for peace funders. So if you identify as a peace funder, please take that survey. Um, and we will also share this information when after this event is over and we'll be sending you an email, you'll get that information then too. So don't worry if you forget to save the link, um, but please do um, look, look for that. And my colleague has just sent that link now. So thank you so much. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Andrew Blum to um, give his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deviani. Um, and hello, everyone. Good morning from California. Here it is morning. It is actually still dark outside. It's really an honor to, to be here. Um, although I'd love, I'd love it if we could all be gathering in Juba as well. Someday uh, I'll come back, Lily, and I'll come see you in Juba. Um, I'm the executive director of the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego. Um, we're an applied research institute, but, but we do research a little bit differently than some other research institutes. The, the real core of our mission is to learn with peacemakers. So we do our research in collaboration with peacemakers that you'll meet today, Lillian and Rena and Ruth and Moserat. 
Um, and one of our core areas um, from the beginning has been women, peace, and security. Um, we house the Women Waging Peace Network, um, which was formerly at Inclusive Security, founded by Swanee Hunt. And for the last 15 years or so, we've been running the Women Peacemaker program annually. Um, when we got started, the Women Peacemaker program was really about a, a chance for women peacemakers to come to our campus to reflect, even to recharge. And we still, you know, we still provide that opportunity. But what we heard from women over the years is that that reflection period is great, but we really need and want to, to drive change in our field also. So as we started working with our women waging peace members and our women peacemakers, you know, to really understand what issues we should focus on, um, what we heard and what we began to focus on was issues like um, how do we assess closing civil society space and increasing threats uh, toward women peacemakers, both in the offline and now uh, particularly in the online spaces? How do we support the next generation of women peace builders to make sure there's peace builders, younger peace builders coming up behind the senior peacemakers we often work with? Um, and of course, how do we continue focus on inclusion of women in peace processes at, at every level? And what we heard a lot is what, you know, our research is focusing on now and what, what we're gonna talk about more today. And that's how to create equitable funding partnerships that are genuinely responsive to the needs of women peace builders. And when we started this work, you know, we, it was interesting. We, we expected the women peacemakers to be a little bit frustrated about the funders. Um, I've worked as a funder, I've worked as somebody who gets funding and you know, complaining about donors is a universal. Everyone complains about donors. Apologies to the donors who are listening. Um, I've been on your side of the table as well. But what we also saw was that the international funders that we worked with were frustrated as well. They knew, they knew what best practice was and they knew the obstacles that they were working with in their own organizations to, to use better practices when they were funding. Um, and so we realized that if we brought funders and women together, we could really figure out and co-create solutions that improve the funding system uh, overall. And we knew we had to have those conversations in places like Washington DC and London and Geneva, where so much of the funding comes from. But also we had to have those conversations in places like Juba and Lahore, where you know, the local dynamics also impact the way funding happens, the way the relationships and the dynamics between international partners and women peace builders uh, are impacted. So that's what this conversation uh, today is doing. What does it look like you know, in Juba uh, to create better funding systems there that really center the work uh, of women peace builders? And I'm sure the conversation today will really contribute to that. Um, as Deviani said, this is part of a, a longer process. We had meetings in San Diego where we dug in on these issues. Uh, we're doing a survey, we're doing interviews, and it's really a 12 month process uh, to get beyond the kind of easy solutions and really find uh, solutions that will drive change in this field and, and create more effective uh, work on the ground by, by women peacemakers. Um, finally, I just want to share some exciting news. Despite all the challenges uh, that are all around us right now, we have identified our four uh, women peacemakers for uh, 2020. I, I can't name names yet, um, but we have four fantastic women who will be joining us from Syria, Yemen, Yemen Iraq and Tanzania. So look for that announcement soon. Um, again, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Lillian. Um, this is gonna be a great event and I'm really honored to be here. Um, so with that, I did wanna turn it over and let our 2019 Women Peacemakers uh, introduce themselves. So I think Ruth Buffalo, you are kicking us off. Hey, good morning. Um, in the, uh, the Hiradza language. Um, 
Madashi Mia Adash heads, uh, Ma Be Sigids, Ma Zigadads, Nakbaga O. Um, hello, good people. My name is Ruth Buffalo. I'm originally from Mandaree. Um, I grew up on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation. I'm a citizen of the Mandan, Hidadza, and Arikara Nation, and I live in South Fargo with my family. Um, I am a women's peacemaker for the 2019 2020. Um, fellowship and it's an honor to be here with you today. A lot of my work is focusing on uh, prevention of further violence against women, um, prevention of further tragedies. As a public health professional, we always want to look at the root causes and a lot of the root causes stem from um, from a lot of uh, poor policies and historical um, trauma and over, overcoming genocide. Um, as a First Nations or a First People um, Indigenous person of these lands here in the United States, um, which I currently am on the Dakota and Anishinaabe people's lands, um, it's so important that we have the uncomfortable conversations first and foremost to address um, a lot of the systemic issues that we're facing today um, are symptoms of larger issues um, that really haven't been addressed in our country. And so it's always good to have those uncomfortable conversations and talk about the true history of our country in order to prevent further violence. So Madzigirads, thank you for having me in this virtual space with you. And I will turn it over to Rina. Good morning, good afternoon from Israel, Palestine. Can you hear me well? Good? Okay. So thank you so much for making this event possible. Thank you first and foremost for Lillian for all the work that you do uh, for women and for the Alliance of Women in South Sudan. My name is Rina Kedem. I live in Israel, Palestine. I work uh, with Palestinians, Israelis, and Jordanians in order to create environmental cooperation and to develop women leadership to economic decision-making um, and to political decision-making. And I wanna share that at the moment, we are in very um, turbulent times here in this land. I don't know how much you're aware, but there's protests, a lot of political protests, and just um, these past few days, a very shocking rape case was um, exposed in the media. Um, and what's happening now for the, almost the first time, there is an uprisal all over the country led by women and not only women, but young women, youth. Um, and this is happening in both the political uprisal and also what I just mentioned. So I think now more than ever, I can say that in this land, people are ready to move on to a step of participatory democracy and leadership and have women be the front. So there's a lot of organizations advocating for it. And I can say that also in the shared realm of Palestinian, Israeli and Jordanian and other countries in the Middle East, women are coming together and I'm part of several organizations that do that work. And we are partnering in order to change the situation uh, and change the face of leadership of this area. So I'm also, I'm grateful for your efforts and I'm joining and supporting whatever you do um, in South Sudan and to know that you are part of a network of women who carry this prayer, who carry this work in their hearts and minds in order to, to have a better future and present right now and for our children. And last, I'll just say that I work with several organizations here, including a local organization that's also called Women Wage Peace. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the biggest, actually biggest grassroots organization um, in Israel. I teach uh, at the Hebrew University about conflict and development and how to do development areas. And I work for two other grassroots reconciliation and research and hands-on community leadership and development. And thank you, it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you so much, Rina. Um, Moserat, are you with us? Okay, I'm gonna then let Lillian uh, introduce herself as well. Um, I believe I'm here. might be uh, and you. Ah, Sorry, there you and are. You. Fantastic. Yes. So I will not be actually, uh, I just thought for, um, so good morning, uh, Andrew. Good morning, good evening to everyone. 
Thank you for having me and congratulations Lillian for organizing such a great event. Uh, I just uh, would like to introduce myself. I'm Musarat Kadim and I run an organization. It's called Paman Trust in Pakistan. Uh, Paman works uh, with women and youth in the area which was hard hit by violent extremism. It's called the area that, um, that borders uh, Afghanistan. It's called Khabar Pakhtunkhwa. So we work with the um, youth um, and women and help them in the de-radicalization, reintegration and rehabilitation uh, rehabilitating them in their communities. Uh, we use um, the religious and cultural narratives to uh, influence the mindset of the youth who had been radicalized by violent extremist groups in Pakistan. We also work with the mothers and with the women uh, in the communities to make them understand and make them realize the negative impact of violent extremism on themselves and in their families and communities and give them the, the leadership skills to be able to lead the peace building initiatives uh, in their communities. This is the work that we have been doing. We do a lot of advocacy on inclusive uh, policy framework, um, inclusive security policy framework uh, in Pakistan, and of course at the international level as well, because when it comes to women, peace and security agenda, uh, most of the countries who have developed the national action plan on 1325, they can work around the framework, but some of the countries like Pakistan who has who have not yet developed the national action plan on 1325, it is so difficult for the civil society organizations to operate because they, there is no framework available and there is always a challenge for us and we are always under the radar of the of the government and of course the security agencies. So we, we, we are working in a very challenging environment. Uh, we really need to actually uh, have a framework within so that we can work within the context of our uh, our country around 1325 and women peace and security agenda we can actually move forward on that i also teach um, at various universities on women peace and security uh, on the women peace and security arena uh, this is the work we do we do a lot of work on peace education and the peace education we don't mean only in the communities we actually have developed inclusive peace curriculum where we want to, we, we have been working with the students of different universities and the madaris. The madaris are the um, religious um, seminaries uh, in Pakistan. So we have been working with the women uh, madaris, uh, female teachers of the madaris, so that they understand how to uh, educate their students around pluralism and, and teach them the value of tolerance uh, and peaceful coexistence. This is the type of work. Um, I have been doing for the last uh, 20 years now. Uh, thank you so much once again, and um, wish you all the best uh, for your endeavor, Lillian, and wish you all the best, uh, the, the, the group that you have just formed. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mosarat. Um, Lillian, over to you. Thank you so much. I, um, my, as you know, my name is Lillian and I have been working in the women's empowerment project for quite some time and I went to work for um, the government. I was the Minister of Finance and then the Agriculture. But now I am back to the civil society work because I love it so much. So I don't want to take that much time, but as you might know, South Sudan is the newest country in the world but yet the least developed ones. So we have a lot of challenges and we are going to hear today from the women from the ground and for, um, from the study that has been done in terms of the women experiencing violence in this newest nation in the world. So I'm looking forward to a very fruitful discussion and um, just back to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Devyani now to take us forward with the event. Thank you so much. It was so great to hear from all of you and thank you, Andrew, as well. Um, now we're going to have um, Dr. Mary Ellsberg give um, a presentation on the No Safe Place study. Mary, to you. Thank you. And yes, I'm off. Thank you, good morning and good afternoon. Um, we are so honored to be able to join Lillian and the other courageous women peacemakers who have just come before me and the other partners who are all joining together to make this a very successful event. Um, we, I'm gonna present 
the findings, very briefly, the headline findings of a study that the Global Women's Institute did together with Care International and the International Rescue Committee um, and funded by the UK government under a project called the What Works to End Violence Against Women in Conflict. And we called the study No Safe Place. This was, um, we presented this, the, the main findings a few years ago, but now we are actually um, publishing the findings in the next few weeks, they'll be coming out in PLOS One and in the journal Violence Against Women. And um, we'd be happy to send copies to all of you who are on this, this webinar. Next slide, please. Um, we decided to do this study in South Sudan, again, because it was the world's newest nation. And as we were starting to look at the issue of violence against women in conflict settings, conflict had just broken out in South Sudan in December of 2013. And we thought it was very important to document what was going on. So we did a survey where we talked to over 2,000 women and almost 500 men in three different sites in, in South Sudan. One was Juba, the capital. The other was Rumbek in Lake State. And the third one was the, the protection of civilians settings in um, outside of Juba, where a large part of the population of Juba, particularly the Nuer citizens, had fled during the crisis, and many of them are still there. So we did a, a survey using a random sample um, based on, on households and maps of households of these almost 3,000 men and women. But we also did qualitative research because we wanted to hear the stories of, um, of women and men and um, both in the community, young women and men and older, older people and um, other kinds of stakeholders, humanitarian actors, um, village leaders, government officials, and understand what they thought was, were the main causes of violence against women and girls. And altogether, we spoke to almost um, 500 or more than 500 people in this qualitative research. Next, please. Um, and just to give you a sense of the kinds of participatory methods we used, we held focus groups where we would ask people to list what are the kinds of violence that were most common in their community, which are the ones that took place within the home, which ones happened in the communities, and what kinds of violence were taking place as a result of the crisis and how these were all related. And then we would go into more detail and we got some very rich, um, rich and, and very moving stories from this. We also spoke to survivors of violence about their own experiences. Next. Um, this is just an example. Your typical focus groups are, you know, eight to 10 people. But when we came to um, interview the local Boma chiefs in this part of uh, Juba, we, we found a much larger group of, of people who also wanted to hear what the chiefs had to say next. And in the Juba POC camps, um, you can imagine how difficult it was to get, be able to talk to people privately. And for us, it's very important when we talk to women that we can maintain complete privacy, that nobody else will be able to hear the conversation so that they're able to talk about their experiences of violence um, in, in an environment where, um, where there won't, they won't have to be afraid that somebody will be, you know, um, will be beating them afterwards for speaking of it or that there, there will be some kind of um, repercussions next. We also made sure, and this is part of our ethical guidelines, that for all of the women that spoke to us that we would have um, opportunities for them to seek counseling. We had 24 hour, um, a day uh, uh, counselors and even transportation so the counselors could go to the house of the women if they were um, experiencing any ill effects, even just fear or sadness from having talked about these experiences. And this is the IRC GBV clinic in the hospital of uh, Rumbek as an example. And we also gave cards to everybody with um, hotline numbers that they could call if they were experiencing difficulties. Next. So just um, a few of the headline uh, findings. One, we found that almost about a third of all women in all three places, Juba, Rumbek, and the POCs, had experienced sexual assault by non-partners. So they'd either experienced rape or attempted rape. Um, more than 40% of them had experienced non-partner sexual violence more than once. And 60% of the women were under 19 when, 
when the rape took place. Um, so this is literally one in three women, and this is about four times the global average in, in the world of rape. So this is one of the places where, um, that has the highest levels of, of rape in the world. Next. Um, we also found, we, we were looking for relationships between the conflict and how that had affected women's safety. And we found that over 70% of the rape that women in Roombeck and POCs um, that they experienced was related to displacement or attacks on their villages, that that's when the majority of the rape took place. A great amount of it, a majority of it was by armed actors. Next. But despite the very extremely high levels of rape in these three sites, we found that women were actually at greater risk of sexual and physical violence from their intimate partners. And this is something that's often not really taken into account in crisis situations, that women are not only experiencing rape as a weapon of war, but they're also experiencing violence in their own homes. So about um, almost three quarters of women had experienced in, in Roombeck and um, about two thirds of women in the other sites had experienced physical or sexual violence from a partner in their lifetime. And you can see that it's also in the last 12 months, very high. And in Roombeck, it was 63%, um, which is also more than double the global averages. So um, that's, you know, it, we think it's really important to understand that women experience many different kinds of violence during their lifetimes and that it, the cumulative effects of this are really devastating. Next. We also in our qualitative interviews um, heard from many, many people about the practice of bride price as being a major driver of, of, of child marriage, abductions and other forms of violence against women, particularly in Roombeck, which is an area that has a lot of cattle raids and people would say over and over again, it really comes back to the cows. So um, families with very few resources who have, or who have lost their resources in the war might be anxious to have their, their girls married at a very young age in order to receive the cattle that come as, as bride price. And young men who don't have cattle or have lost their, have lost their, their wealth might resort to rape or to abduction or to cattle raids in order to um, be able to marry. And so this was something that we also found was um, a real key driver of, of a lot of the violence that was taking place. Next. Um, this was a line that, um, that we heard from somebody in Roombeck, that girl, women and girls are often beaten by brothers and uncles and anyone who benefits from the cows. Next. This is a line from a woman activist in Roombeck. We are tired of being raped. We met with the chiefs and raised our concerns. We have had no response yet. And um, I put this line here because I think it's, um, it, it's so important to honor and to acknowledge the work of women peacemakers in South Sudan. They have played such an important role and they've been so courageous in standing up to the violence um, and demanding peace. And um, one of our main recommendations at the end of this study has been, and we've presented this at, in, in the UN, at the Security Council, and to um, donors and, and members of the peace negotiations, the importance of having women peacemakers at the, at the negotiation tables, to have them involved in the state building and peace building that, comes as a, that is coming hopefully as a result of the, um, the peace negotiations and to support autonomous women's groups because the work that they're doing is so, so vital. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, we presented originally our findings um, in more in a policy environment and um, internationally, but we thought it was so important that these findings also be um, accessible to women in the country and be, that they could be able to use them in their own efforts. So just last year we did, and this is the next slide, we carried out a workshop in Juba um, with the participation of women's groups from all over South Sudan and um, presented the results and then worked with them and with South Sudanese artists to develop materials that would allow um, women to talk about these findings in their communities and talk with their communities about um, possible solutions. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to close by showing you, these are the artists. This is how 
um, the artists and the activists worked together to sort of develop the, what, what they thought were images that would both describe the drivers of violence, what made communities unsafe, as well as solutions and what would make communities safer. Next slide, please. And these are just some examples of the pictures that came up showing, for example, cattle raids as a res and, and abduction of girls, and then the, the safe community version of communities getting together to celebrate events and, and not be fighting. Next one. This is um, an image of, of uh, intimate partner violence of a man who is, who is potentially forcing his wife into sex when she doesn't want to and the alternative, which would be peaceful communication and, and cooperation between partners. And the final one, which was obviously, next slide, the, the most important piece that um, all South Sudanese women and men that we spoke to were, um, their, their greatest wish was for peace and for upholding the, the constitution and the rights of both men and women. And I will stop there and thank you again for allowing us to participate in this event. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for sharing that. Um, next, we have um, Dr. Patricia Morris, and she'll, um, she's the Director of Gender and Inclusive Development at Encompass. Morris. Yes, good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, and it's uh, really great uh, to be here. I'm going to be uh, presenting on some results of uh, still ongoing study that um, the uh, South Sudan Women's Empower Empowerment Network and uh, Lillian, uh, who we met earlier, um, are, are, are working on uh, and that you know, we've been supporting. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna present some preliminary findings on perspectives about the factors affecting support for women's civil society organizations in South Sudan uh, to be able to address you know, the um, gender-based violence issues that Mary has just talked about and other um, development and relief uh, issues in, uh, in South Sudan. Next slide. So um, the South Sudan uh, Women's Network and uh, of course the, the Croc uh, Institute, um, as Andrew has mentioned earlier, is conducting this, you know, big research on uh, funding uh, for, for women's uh, organizations. And um, so uh, Lillian and the South Sudan Women's uh, Empowerment Network are focusing specifically on South Sudan uh, and, and, and doing a, you know, a, a, a multi um, uh, mixed methods you know, research you know, on this that also includes you know, interviews with donors and with women's organizations. But the early part of the research that we've done has been a survey that examines from uh, South Sudanese women's organizations perspectives, factors that affect funding for their organizations. Um, and as we've already discussed, you know, these women-led organizations are working to end cycles of violence against women and to promote women's participation and protection and other uh, women peace and security issues. Next slide. Um, so, you know, as, as um, we've sort of mentioned uh, earlier, uh, women-led organizations in South Sudan are really providing key humanitarian and development assistance in their communities, including GBV programming, advocacy campaigns, you know, for peace, legal aid, economic empowerment, health um, services. But these organizations face enormous challenges in, in accessing direct funding, you know, from peace funders, including uh, the fact that, you know, a lot of the funding that they get is indirect funding through intermediary organizations, like international NGOs, uh, their own limited institutional capacity, weak financial accountability systems, and lack of adequate external uh, support. Next slide. And so we wanted to be able to, as part of this study, a, a, to identify what are the kinds of things that need to happen to strengthen the partnership between women-led organizations and international peace funders or donors in South Sudan, and also to begin to have 
some indications of how to develop a program that would strengthen South Sudanese women's organizations' capacity to access donor for funding. Next slide. So let me tell you a little bit about this survey. It's an online survey. It was collected recently, July 17th to August 17th. Um, the population for the survey was the Women's Peacemakers um, of South Sudan Network. Uh, there are about 105 um, you know, members you know, of that network. Um, the number of, of uh, individuals that uh, answered uh, the online survey uh, was 36, which means that we had a you know, uh, response rate of 34%. Of 34 so let me share with you, um, you know, some of the results of the survey. And we basically asked questions, you know, looking at, you know, four areas and trying to get, um, you know, uh, South Sudanese women's organizations perspectives on these four issues. So the first is donor interest and confidence in um, a donor interest in funding um, for uh, women, peace and security issues and their confidence in South Sudanese women's organization. Uh, questions about their preferences for inter unit for funding intermediary organizations. Uh, questions on donor requirements and what in the extent to which women's organizations can can meet those or some of the challenges they're faced there. And then some larger questions about the women's organizations, you know, capacity uh, to be able to um, secure uh, funding. So here are some of the results. Next slide. Um, you know, we did ask questions about adequacy of funding. And, uh, you know, one question was whether or not funding is enough for the work that needs to be done on women, peace and security uh, issues. And 50% of the respondents disagreed or strongly disagreed with that, saying that they really felt that the, the funding, you know, was, was, was not enough. In terms of uh, their perspectives on, uh, please go back to the other one. In terms of their perspectives on accessing uh, funding and the extent to which you know, it is, um, you know, it's, it's the, you know, they have the ability uh, to do so. There again, we see that the majority, you know, 74% either disagreed or strongly disagreed, you know, with that statement. Uh, next slide. You know, we ask questions about donor interests, understanding and, and, and confidence and, you know, uh, it was really an overwhelming uh, majority, 84%, either strongly agreed or agreed that donor interest um, in peace, women, peace and security issues in um, South Sudan is high. Um, we also asked about, you know, the extent to which donors understand the contributions that women's organizations are bringing to peace and security issues. And here again, you know, 84% either strongly agreed or agreed, um, you know, that donors understand what those con con um, contributions are. On the other hand, however, when asked about the extent to which they believe that donor organizations have confidence in their capabilities, you know, here we see that almost half, 48%, disagreed or strongly disagreed uh, with, with that statement. So high interest in the issues, you know, but you know, low confidence in the extent to which uh, South, Sudanese, South Sudanese women's organizations um, uh, can, can address those issues. Next slide. We also ask questions about preference for intermediary um, uh, organizations on the part of, of donors. Uh, and, you know, as you can see here as well, some really high responses in, you know, related to, to donor preference for these organizations. And the first question we asked, do um, the extent to which, you know, representatives of South Sudanese women's organizations believe that donors um, uh, funding um, for uh, peace and security is issues go more to intermediary um, organizations like international NGOs as opposed to local Sudanese, South Sudanese women's organizations. And here we see 
um, you know, the majority, almost all, 97% either strongly agree or agree with that, that statement. Um, the fourth question, you know, is also in a similar vein where we ask about um, is there a higher preference um, for the international NGOs than for the South Sudanese women's organizations for donor funding? And here we see 87% um, either strongly agree or agree with that statement as well. And then we ask a couple of questions about partnerships with intermediary organizations. First one, you know, asking about the extent to which intermediate organizations that are working on women, peace and security issues, you know, partner with South Sudanese women's organizations. And here, you know, the, the responses are really across, across the board, like 43% agree, 26%, you know, about a quarter of the respondents, neither agree or disagree, and another 23%, you know, um, disagree you know, with that, with that statement. And so I think it suggests that there are differences in experiences that different organizations are having in terms of partnering with um, um, intermediary organizations. And then we asked another question in terms of, you know, when there is partnership, you know, is the share of funding that is awarded to the South Sudanese women organizations sufficient for the contracted program activities uh, that they would be working on? And here, also a very large majority, 69%, um, disagree or strongly disagree with that statement. Couple more results to share. Uh, next slide. We ask questions about donor requirements, you know, to get a sense of, you know, in terms of like, you know, proposal requirements, uh, reporting requirements, you know, have you know, are, are at a level that may not be at the level where South Sudanese women's organizations are because they're really smaller um, uh, organizations. Uh, and, you know, here are some of the results that we found. Um, you know, and to the statement that donor proposal requirements are complex and is one of the reasons why few numbers of South Sudanese women's organizations apply, 94% uh, either agreed or strongly agreed, you know, with that statement. In terms of donor reporting requirements uh, being burdensome uh, for South Sudanese women's organizations, um, you know, 54% either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement, but, you know, 30% disagreed with that. So we also have, you know, almost a third that are saying that um, you know, the donor requirements are not uh, burdensome, even though the majority agree that it is. And then finally, um, the question about, you know, what should donors do about this? Should they provide proposal preparation, capacity building for South Sudanese women's organizations, for instance, and 96% of the respondents either um, agreed or strongly agreed with that. Next slide. Final results that I want to share with you, we did ask also about, you know, South Sudanese women's organizations capacity in terms of uh, being able to, um, you know, you know, have the sort of capabilities to, um, to actually go after and secure uh, funding. And what we find is that the majority of the respondents either strongly agreed or agreed on the four points that we asked about, right? Uh, when we asked, you know, if South Sudanese women's organizations had higher experience and capacity in proposal development, you know, would they be able to receive more donor funding? 72%, um, you know, strongly agreed or agreed with that. When we asked about, you know, having more capacity in terms of financial accountability, 76% either strongly agreed or agreed with that. When we asked about, you know, having, you know, greater capabilities in grant reporting, and if that would then have, you know, more of an impact on them being able to um, receive more donor funding, 69% um, either strongly agreed or agreed with that. And then we asked the question about um, support uh, for core costs and overhead, and if they felt that if they were to get more external support to that, if that would help them to achieve more donor funding, and 87% either strongly agreed 
or agree uh, with that um, as well. Next slide. And so quickly, I just want to summarize, you know, uh, what we found uh, from the survey. Uh, and one is that the adequacy of funding for women and peace and security issues and the accessibility to funding for women uh, organizations uh, in South Sudan um, are, are, are insufficient as far as the survey respondents are concerned. Also, uh, that donor interest in uh, funding these issues is high and donors' understanding of the contribution that women organizations are making uh, for, um, you know, to peace and security and, um, you know, anti-gender-based violence work, uh, that um, donors um, understand the contributions that South Sudanese women's organizations are making there. Um, on the other hand, the respondents believe that donor confidence in their ability to do the work is, is low. So that's an interesting, you know, um, you know contrast there. Um, they also believe that donors prefer to fund uh, intermediary organizations and that most of the, the funding actually does go to intermediary organizations. And that when intermediary organizations partner um, with South Sudanese women's organizations, the share of funding is insufficient for their program activities. Next slide. Uh, final set of um, uh, summary of what we found. Uh, Dodo, um, the South Sudanese women's organizations that responded to the survey um, believe that donor and proposal reporting requirements are constraints, um, that they would receive more funding if they had increased capacity in proposal preparation, financial accountability, and grant reporting. Uh, they also feel that donors should provide capacity building for proposal cooperation, uh, preparation for their organizations and that more external support for core costs and overhead would increase their ability to secure donor funding. Next slide. So in conclusion, I mean, I think we've, we've seen also from uh, Mary's presentation that, you know, South Sudanese women's organizations play an important role in ending cycles of violence. Uh, they've been very, um, um, they've, they've worked for years and years during the prolonged war to spread the message of peace. They advocate for women's inclusion in the decision making processes at all levels. Um, they also provide necessary services. Uh, and community development and humanitarian assistance programs. And so it does seem that it is really important for us to find ways to address the constraints that South Sudanese women organizations face in securing don donor funding to, act to adequately support the work that they're doing, but also to scale up the work that they're doing because we know that it's really important and effective work. Uh, and in the end, it's essential to peace and security in uh, South Sudan. Next slide. So thank you so very much. And you know, we'll be happy to uh, take your questions during the Q&A part of uh, this event. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, um, for that wonderful presentation. Um, now we'll be transitioning into um, the, the South Sudan Women Peacemakers panel and Dr. Morris will be moderating this uh, panel. And we have four wonderful panelists today and I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Mor Morris to moderate. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, you know, good morning and good afternoon again. We are so happy to be able to have representatives, uh, South Sudanese Women Peacemakers you know, organizational representatives that are on the ground doing the real important um, work. And, um, you know, we have Jacqueline and Julia and Josephine and Rose. And uh, we'd first like to begin with, you know, having each of them uh, tell us a little bit, you know, about it, their organization and the work that they're doing and the challenges that they're, they're facing to be able to you know, have the adequate resources to address, you know, gender-based violence and other women, peace and security issues. Maybe we'll be begin with Jacqueline. Uh, 
um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening and good afternoon uh, all over the world. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Swen and the university for organizing this forum. I'm called Jacqueline Nasiwa. I'm the founder of a women's rights uh, organization in South Sudan called the Center for Inclusive Governance, Peace and Justice, uh, which was founded in 2017. And uh, we have uh, four main areas where we work. One is on uh, governance and women leadership, and then access to justice and transitional justice, uh, peace building and uh, community empowerment. Uh, for the last uh, past years, we have been working on victims uh, project where we support victims and survivors of human rights violations. Uh, we operate in uh, three main areas uh, in Jongole, which is Bor, uh, in Western Equatoria in Mundri, in Central Equatoria in Ye, and our office is in Juba. Uh, we have also been doing a lot of work on transitional justice, like empowering communities to be engaging in transitional justice so that it's a citizens-led process. We have developed quite a number of uh, civic education materials, which included a uh, pictorial uh, citizen's guide to the transitional justice process, and were able to analyze the peace agreement from a gender lens and uh, including the legal analysis of the peace agreement and making recommendations where women can be effectively participating. Uh, with funding from CARE, we are able to do women's rights uh, awareness campaign and also working with communities to dialogue on issues of sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, currently, some of our legal officers are part of the mobile court, which is operating in Terekeka now, and we are providing a legal defense to some of the victims and clients, which included victims of gender-based violence. Uh, we are also doing capacity building for some of the victims and survivors on uh, trauma healing and counseling, training of trainers, and also we are holding public forums, including in, with the University of Juba on transitional justice, as you can see in the uh, picture in the picture. Um, we have also small institution and some of our funding goes to institutional capacity building of our staff, which included financial uh, support and uh, systems, establishing systems for the organization and also uh, reporting. Um, in terms of our challenges, we have quite a lot of challenges and I think some of them are mentioned already in the research. One is the high donor requirement. So sometimes the donors require things to do with having an established office, having uh, audit reports, and you know, as a young organization, we have not been audited, and that makes us to lose out in some of the um, uh, proposals. The other one is that most donors, they have already their traditional uh, partners. And for us being new um, uh, with the civil society space, we miss out because they already have designated civil society that they work with and women's rights organizations are mostly new and they come together with the peace processes. Uh, the other challenge we have is that uh, when you look at uh, the donor requirement, sometimes they go through intermediaries as said, and some of these intermediaries, they really don't have a mandate that works with women. So they only put women's organizations as mainstreaming gender, and it's not part and component of their core um, uh, goal that they would like to empower more women. So that makes women's uh, projects and proposals within this context to miss out because mainstreaming gender is not really a whole project that empowers women. And finally, I could say that uh, um, we also have a challenge with lack of feedback from donors. There's little capacity that they input to women's rights organizations. And sometimes when we miss out in the proposals, we don't get feedback that can help us to improve. And hence women feel frustrated and we can no longer continue to apply for projects. And we keep asking ourselves, what's wrong with our proposals as women's rights organizations? Yet some organizations keep getting the funding. So these are some of the challenges that are hampering our work and it's making us not to move forward as women's rights organizations. Thank you for the organization. Jacqueline, thank you so very much, uh, you know, for that and for identifying, you, you know, a, a, a number of, of, of challenges and, you know, I, I, you know, I think two new ones that you've identified are the fact that many organizations 
are new so they don't have a track record with donors, but also that there's a lack of, of, of feedback. Um, let's go now to Julia. And uh, Julia, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your organization and what are some of the challenges uh, that you're facing? Um, good, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Uh, maybe just to uh, first say a quick thank you to the organizers and in particular Swen for this opportunity to be able to participate in this conversation today. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Julia, uh, Julia Akur. I'm currently the Deputy Chair Lady of the Federation of Women Lawyers of South Sudan. Um, the objectives of FIDA South Sudan include provision of legal aid services to indigent women and children, uh, creating awareness on the rights of women and children, advocacy and lobbying for the enactment of gender sensitive laws and policies, advocacy and lobbying for increased opportunities for women across all sectors, and finally building the capacity of women lawyers and acting as a platform for women lawyers to come together and support each other. Some of the past work that we have done has included training of community-based paralegals, provision of legal aid to victims of rape and other forms of GBV, advocacy and lobbying for the inclusion of women and gender concerns in the transitional constitution of South Sudan, as well as advocacy and lobbying for the inclusion of women and gender concerns in the peace agreement during the peace negotiations. If I move on to the funding challenges that we have, uh, one of the things I can say is that as an organization, we were really affected by the conflict that erupted in 2013, whereby a number of donors, and in particular our main partner, which was packed, pulled out of South Sudan, and a lot of donor funding was diverted away from development type work, work to humanitarian aid, such as provision of food, water, and shelter. And as an organization, and I think we also get a sense of donor fatigue when it comes to South Sudan. The expectations were high during the independence of South Sudan, but the recurrence of the conflict has really caused a lot of uh, donor fatigue. Also, currently what we are, we are facing is the reality that of COVID-19 now has related in a lot of delays to donor funding and a lot of funds, have, a lot of funds and activities have been put on hold due to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, for us as an organization, an organization such as PACT, which is an international uh, NGO, is an important partner for us as they were in a position to access larger funding, as well as they would sit with us and help us through the whole process of writing joint uh, proposals, developing work plans, and monitoring and reporting and results. Um, I can say another challenge for us also is that um, we, as an organization, we have often looked to donors and partners in South Sudan to get funding for our work. The funding is limited and there are many organizations competing for, for the same kitty. The funds are also disbursed for activities on an annual basis or for a very short term uh, time. Uh, so it makes planning for longer term activities very difficult and sustainability very difficult. And then so often we find that there are long durations of, of times in between projects where our staff will go without salaries and have to meet costs such as transport costs to project sites out of their own pockets. Another challenge I would say is that as lawyers, uh, we are not trained in financial management and project proposal writing, and I need of, and certainly we find that we're in need of donors who can give us funding for core activities to hire administrative su staff, such as finance staff, and help us to scale and grow by training us and building our capacity in these areas. Because an, um, an important part of qualifying for this call for proposals is having the financial systems in place. So core funding can really go a long way in helping us in, in this area. Um, another challenge I would say is that one of our key strategies in the past has been to partner with international NGOs or intermediaries who are in a better position to meet uh, donor requirements for the preparation of the project proposals and have in place the financial capacity. But we now find that maybe we have to come back as an organization and begin to rethink our strategy. Certainly intermediaries are important, but we also find that it, it makes our growth difficult 
because uh, the intermediaries themselves take take uh, a subsidiary uh, take an amount of money for their own budget costs and to cover their own administrative costs therefore leaving us limited funding to co to cover our own our own costs so it makes it really difficult for us to scale up our activities uh, and to grow and also we find that sometimes in the process the work that we do and visibility for the work that we do gets lost along the way so not helping to build us uh, build build up our ability to be able in future to be able to access such funding. Um, another challenge I would say is that as FIDA we have been a launching pad for a number of young lawyers whom we source from the universities in Juba. However, unfortunately we we are not able to retain the staff as we cannot pay competitive salaries due to lack of funds and our lack of know-how on where and how to access for funding. So some of our staff, once trained and exposed, go on to work with the partner organizations who they have been coordinating with. So for us, really access to sufficient core funding will really help us to be able to retain and better train our staff. Um, I'd say one, uh, another challenge I'd say is that one of our objectives is to be able to train female lawyers to provide a platform where female legal professionals can support each other. Uh, the legal profession, as you probably all know, in South Sudan is very male. So many South Sudanese lawyers were trained in Khartoum under a different system of, of law, and many of them were trained also in Arabic and do not and, and, and not able or confident in their in English. So the women's security, the women peace and security agenda is also about increasing women's voice and participation at all levels. As an organization, we do not have sufficient uh, access to sufficient funds to be able to train and engage our members. We'd like to train our members to see more lawyers gain the confidence to open up their own law firms and provide legal aid, advance in the bench and work in prosecutions, and be a critical voice advocating for gender sensitive developments in the rule of law sector. So lack of sufficient funding has really uh, hampered in this. We know that some of the neighboring FIDA organizations such as FIDA Kenya and FIDA Uganda have come up with innovative ways when it comes to looking for funds like, for example, charging membership fees, they actively go out to the private sector to try and get funding. Or some of them have developed programs of a FIDA, a Friends of FIDA program where they invite private donations from, from individuals. But the economic crisis currently in South Sudan has made this difficult for us to begin to try to implement. Um, I'd say a final challenge that we face is that as much as we are an international branch of, uh, of, the, of, of FIDA International, we do not get funding from FIDA International and we are not able to engage in activities together with other branches. And I'll, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Great, Julia. Thank you so very much. Uh, let's go on to uh, Josephine. You could tell us a little bit about uh, steward women and some of the challenges that you're facing. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to attend this virtual meeting and also thanks to the organizers, Swen and the university for putting together this convening. My name is Josephine Chandiru Drama. I work with Steward Women and I'm the director since 2012. Steward stands for Support the Empowerment of Women and Their Rights for Development. So we decided to add the word women because our focus is women. And in our focus with women, we provide access to justice for women and girls in South Sudan. We are established in two, 2009 and currently we work in um, four states. Central Equatoria, we work in Juba, Eastern Equatoria, we work in Nimule, Magui, Torit and Capueta, Unity State, we, we work in Bentiu, and then Jongole State, we are in Bor. Some of our pre, uh, past achievements include uh, prosecuting uh, the first child marriage case, which is a landmark case. And, and if you Google it, you'll find it. We are also, we have prosecuted over 45 uh, uh, rape cases in South Sudan, mostly through the mobile court. We are currently the chair of the rule of law technical reference group of the GBV subcluster in South Sudan. 
We also have observer status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights um, that sits in the Gambia. We are supposed to give our first human rights report in November 2021. Um, coming to the, the work, the challenges of the work that we are doing, I'm just going to talk generally about donors because I don't know who is a donor who is intermediary. The one who gives me money is I know I will be referring to that as the donor. So coming to the challenges, legal aid in South Sudan accounts for only 1% of the services provided to survivors. And this is basically because donors view provision of legal aid services for victims, not a life-saving service. They think medical is more life-saving Psychosocial support is more life-saving, but I feel legal is also equally more life-saving because if we do not provide legal services for survivors, impunity will continue. Women will also continue to suffer. There will be case backlogs and a lot of those things. Um, secondly, uh, another challenge is the prosecution of cases is very expensive. Julia and Jacqueline can allude to that. Um, lawyers can charge, uh, um, the, the town lawyers can charge from 3,000 to 4,500, especially in criminal cases and even most especially in rape cases. So this is very, very expensive for the local or the indigent person to access because they can't afford that amount of money because they're even barely living with $2 per day on their feeding. Um, Julia talked about uh, short periods of funding, but I also want to add that in, in addition to the short periods of funding, sometimes funding, donors also give us funding in kind. In terms of, they tell you, uh, steward women, we are entering into partnership with you. Your work will be to facilitate. For us, we come with our attendance sheet. We come with transport to fund. We pay for the hall. We pay for the refreshment. This is happening. So with that kind of attitude, how do you expect to empower a women-led organization that is coming up? Uh, besides that, another challenge is also proposals take very long periods to process. Uh, taking an example of the COVID-19 proposal for women-led organizations that was called in April 2020, and that time, uh, the first case of COVID-19 had just come out. Up to today, I haven't had some, uh, any information about that. And now the cases are over 2,000. So that is one of the challenges. Um, another challenge is the current conversation on the Grand Bargain. Grand Bargain is focusing on localization agenda where the focus is moving from international organizations to local or national actors, but more specific to women-led organizations. I think as far as South Sudan is, ex uh, is concerned, we experienced that, or we enjoyed that, uh, the local, the, the grand bargain only for one year, 2019. But as far as I know, that's, localization agenda has died in South Sudan because the focus is moving from uh, local organizations to international organizations. And even when funding is given to both local and international organizations, it is three, is three local and three international. How sure are we that in those three for local, women organizations are inclusive. And the ratio is usually one, one, 150,000 USD for local organization and international gets 1,500,000. And this ratio is counted one is to one. I think that is another challenge for us. Jacqueline talked of lack of feedback uh, on proposals. Mine is to say that donors have been saying that the, the proposals, they received great amounts of proposals and they are not able to give feedback. How come the SSHF proposal in South Sudan receives more than 1,500 proposals and each one gets to get feedback on what happened to their proposal? Just another example is where a call for proposal was made in Juba for legal aid providers coming from women-led organizations. At that time, we were only three women-led organizations. 
that was in 2017. Up to today, we never got feedback on what happened to proposals. And they, they want to tell me that three women-led organizations are amounting to so many, they received so many proposals from women-led organizations. That's taking, that, that analysis is very vague to me. Another challenge that we are facing is that uh, funds are designed by donors for specific locations. This makes us lose the hotspots. For example, hotspots for sexual violence. You'll find out that uh, a proposal for COVID-19 will be targeting a location which is not even a hotspot. So that is another challenge with the donors. Um, another challenge is donors imposing their own policies when signing contracts. A case in point is where a donor says we are sending this staff, most especially the local staff, we are sending this staff to implement together with you on this project. And then because of the, th those systems of first installments, second installment, when there are delays in release of funds, these local staff take us to court. I'm talking this from uh, an experienced point of view, our view. I've been imprisoned in Juba prison because the donor imposed on us their own policies. Um, the last one I want to conclude with is, uh, um, is the issue of kickback. The, this kickback is where the donor gives you a project and takes back another percentage. And then connected to this one is where donor uh, staff have also opened small organizations. Sometimes we, we submit our proposals and these proposals are taken and implemented by the small organizations that belong to this donor staff. So I, I feel that with available resources, we can do more than what we are currently doing. Thank you for listening to me. Great, Josephine, thank you so very much. Uh, let's now hear from uh, Rose uh, from, uh, you know, her organization and what, you know, um, from her viewpoint or some of the challenges that women's organizations are facing in uh, South Sudan. Rose? Uh, good morning and good afternoon, good evening from wherever we are. I'm by name Rose Achinden, uh, Executive Director of Legacy for African Women and Children Initiative, a national women-led organization registered uh, uh, in Juba, based in Juba, uh, with an aim of empowering and encourage and support children and women. Uh, we have some uh, activities. Uh, we really uh, look at the current activities, the priorities, current activities. Uh, we are working on gender, uh, in preventing gender, uh, and responding to GBV, GBV. And then we are uh, doing also economic empowerment, whereby we train men in interviewership. Uh, we give them life skill training in order to run the enterprises for uh, livelihood and the sustainability in the economic. And then we have uh, peace building. We work closely with women at the grassroots level. Where Hello, Rose, are you still there? Ah, I think she's coming back online. 
Please continue, Rose. Yes, Please continue, Rose. You're on, Rose, so you can continue with your statement. <clears throat> Rose, are you there? I think we may have lost our, our connection uh, with, with uh, uh, Rose, uh, but you know, you'll be able to ask her questions uh, during the uh, Q&A section um, of the um, event uh, when you know she's able to to log log back on, I want to um, thank you know each of you uh, for sharing with us you know what you see as a number of the uh, you know constraints and challenges uh, in terms of funding for all of the important and and good work. Uh, that. For all the important and good work that you um, that you have been been doing, and I just like to to maybe if you can very quickly because our time is up, maybe in one sentence, sort of tell us what you think is the the, the best way to move forward in terms of building relationships with donors and being able to be able to um, attract uh, you know more support you know, for uh, you know all of this work that you're doing. Jackie, maybe one sentence. What do you think is the most important thing that can be done? Um, hello. Yeah, I think what needs to be done is to empower uh, women leaders to be able to uh, manage the organizations and also to be able to continue with their advocacy. So I think when donors will be making their proposals, they should have uh, something for women's empowerment and capacity building of women leaders. Great, thank you. Julia, what's your recommendation? Um, I, I still believe that intermediaries are very important to help us as we, as we try and grow, but we, we ask that we get intermediaries who can you know, take us through the whole process of building our capacity in the, in the various areas of financial management, the reporting, the writing, the project proposals. So, and giving us also equal visibility for the work that we do so that we can eventually be able to, in future, be able to scale up and to, and to grow. Hey, great. Uh, Josephine, what's your recommendation? Um, donors should give us long periods of funds, at least three years to five years. In between there, they can be able to, to see if we are growing and if, and if we are not grow, growing. Additionally, the, the institutional support for, for really paying the salaries of some key staff so that we don't lose them. We don't lose those whose capacities we have built to uh, international organizations. So the core support and also overheads should be supported for women-led organizations. Great, thank you so much, uh, Josephine. I, I believe that, um, I believe that Rose is back in. Uh, Rose, you know, what uh, recommendation would you have uh, for uh, uh, donors going forward? I would recommend the uh, build, building and empower South Sudanese women organization technically as in projects or program management, uh, proposal writing and reporting skills, and financial management. And it would be good also to uh, avail direct funding opportunities to South Sudanese uh, led women organization and set up 
and strengthen women network as the main thing. Great, thank you so and much. And I'm sorry Paul. that my network disappointed me. Uh, yeah, that's thank okay. you. Uh, we're glad that you're still with us. Jacqueline, Julia, Josephine, and Rose, you, you all are all, your change makers, your peacemakers, and you know, we are so um, you know, grateful for all of the important work that you're doing and really pleased that you have, are joining us uh, today. We're going to now move on to our, our next panel. Uh, I want to remind uh, um, you know, participants you know, on the event that you can uh, submit uh, questions for the Q&A section uh, uh, where it says Q and, and aid um, down at the bottom uh, of, your, of your screen uh, so that uh, we can um, uh, raise them for all of the panelists uh, once we finish this final panel, which we are talking to international peace funders. We are so pleased to be able to have a representative from USAID and a representative from the Open Society uh, for, for East Africa, Jennifer and, and Don. And so we, we welcome you and thank you for being here with us. And I uh, would like to start with, um, you know, what you see as the biggest challenge, you know, for donors, not only your own organizations, but the whole donor community in uh, funding uh, South Sudanese women's organizations, and maybe also to say a bit about how that challenge, you know, has changed um, in uh, the time of COVID. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to go first? Thank you, Dr. Morris. It's, it's a pleasure to have folks here today. I don't know if it'd be helpful to provide some context about the work we're doing and then maybe get into the challenges. Is sure, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. My name is Jennifer Hawkins, and I'm the Senior WPS Advisor at USAID. I sit in Washington, D.C. Um, thank you to our esteemed colleagues and the panel, GW, Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice, and a very huge thank you to Lillian Razik and the South Sudanese Women's Empowerment Network for hosting this important event. And I also would like to acknowledge our Peace Fellows, Ruth, Rina, and Musarat, who I'm personally honored to have the opportunity to get to know and work closely with this past year through our mutual collaboration with Croc IPJ. Um, as you know, we are, have a great partnership with Croc IPJ in increasing a learning agenda around this very question, which Dr. Morris presented. Um, we are pleased to discuss best practices in funding local women's-led peace-building organizations and really building an equitable partnership with women peace-builders. To that end, we are actually hosting a discussion with our colleagues at the State Department, uh, the Department DOD and DHS, just next week to discuss this very issue, the challenges associated with equitable partnerships with local women and women-led organizations around the world. Um, just to give you some background on WPS and what we're doing um, for the USG, uh, in 2019, just this past uh, June of 2019, we released our, our strategy on women, peace, and security. We have the first ever legislation on WPS in the world where it actually um, makes women, peace, and security law. So the WPS Act of 2017 is a law, meaning no matter what, our government is responsible as a part of its foreign policy agenda to implement 1325. We also have an implementation plan for USAID and each of the agencies that I mentioned earlier also has an implementation plan, which is all available online and for the public. Um, I would just kind of give you kind of the, the buckets that our, our WPS plan outlines. Participation is one, of course, a real solid principle of women, peace, and security. And then, of course, protection, which is kind of the topic of this uh, conversation here today. We also are focused on increasing our internal cap capacities. Uh, so just much like local organizations, we have to do a better job with increasing our staff's training and capacity on WPS. And then, of course, the final is increasing our partnership with governments around the world on increasing their capacity to implement 1325. So, for example, we have a very good and interesting partnership with the African Union, 
which is uh, holding member states accountable for their implementation of 1325. It's in particularly including increasing women's participation at all levels of decision-making processes. To the, uh, the issue of funding, my office holds a very small pot of funding, which we are using to advance meaningful participation in peace processes and address the needs of women and girls affected by violent extremism, which I know Mosarat works closely in that area. And of course, increasing the protection of women and girls in areas of crisis and conflict and stability. I will say, I'm not an expert on South Sudan, but I just wanted to provide you with a brief overview of the incredible work our team is doing at the mission, which is closely aligned to the objectives of women, peace and security. And of course, the topic here today. Um, I'm very proud to report that our mission in South Sudan is mainstreaming gender and protection in all of its programs and act activities. Our WPS efforts in South Sudan are strengthening and enhancing the role of civil society and citizens' abilities to engage the government constructively in key consensus building and political processes related to women's participation in peace and reconciliation process. USAID supports South Sudanese civil society, including ongoing support to the Women's Monthly Forum and participation of women's groups in the 2014-2015 peace process. In terms of protection and violence, since 2013, USAID has scaled up its activities to mitigate risk of women and children to provide care for survivors of gender-based violence. Our humanitarian assistance is providing survivors of violence with medical treatment, counseling, mental health, and psychosocial support services, and a referral to other services along with psychological first aid training for social workers and volunteers. At the community level, we're supporting awareness for protection issues and the services available to support them addressing these issues. For example, we're providing a mobile psychosocial team to provide basic emotional support to internally displaced persons and the establishment of safe spaces for women and children. So I really look forward to continue the conversation uh, here today. And of course, working closely with our colleagues at the South Sudan mission and all the missions around the world, frankly, in implementing uh, women, peace and security. Um, I, in terms of your question regarding uh, you know, challenges, we, we really tried to unpack this a lot in our time at CROC together. And I think it was a really good understanding of having two conversations with the donors and the partners on the challenges. And it was just an understanding of the world. I think they were very fascinated to know how complex <laughs> our funding mechanisms can be and all the restrictions as we talk about requirements for reporting that we're under to report again, particularly for our monies, you know, even having the conversation with the Peace Fellows about the congressional kind of requirements that we have to report to Congress about the funds that we spend. So that's why the reporting uh, requirements sometimes seem very onus. Um, so there are some challenges in terms of getting money rapidly to organizations. We did this really well in Burma, and I would love to kind of repeat this, is where we were paying for child care and elder care or transportation to actually get women to the peace table and participate um, in peace processes or just training where they couldn't participate if they didn't have the means to pay for those very simple issues. So I think that is one example where I would love to have a flexible funding mechanism for those types of things going forward to implement WPS. Um, and so we're gonna unpack that next week and get our brains together with our colleagues at the State Department and Department of Defense and DHS to think about how we really can have some concrete efforts to amplify uh, those flexible funding mechanisms. Thank you. Great, thank you so very much, uh, Julia. Uh, Don, um, what's your take on all of this? What do you see as some of the, the big challenges and how is COVID affecting funding and what are some of the kinds of things that the Op Open Society uh, Initiative for East Africa is working on? Good, uh, good afternoon, good evening and good morning everyone wherever you are. Uh, my name is Don Bosco Malish. I am a uh, I'm an advisor to the Open Society Initiative for Eastern Africa. The Open Society Initiative for Eastern Africa was founded in 2005 as part of the Global Open Society Foundation Network, uh, we're a private donor and we operate in Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, 
Tanzania, Sudan, Rwanda, South Sudan. And one of uh, our work in South Sudan and Sudan started in 2009 and 2011, respectively, these two countries. Uh, we, the Open Society Initiative for Eastern Africa, OSEA, vision is working for a just, inclusive, vibrant Eastern Africa where all people live in dignity, equality, and participate meaningfully in their society. Our program areas include democratic governance and the rule of law, equality and non-discrimination, that's where our women and youth program falls, health and rights, and economic governance. We support individuals, initiatives, and organizations, and including also government agencies. We seek to empower by keeping our eyes on, but hands off as we support these uh, partners. Uh, the way we are organized as the Open Society, we have regional foundations like where I fall, but we also have thematic groups which program everywhere, but at least for us, we program within the region. Um, in South Sudan, our current portfolio of partners is under 27, with the funding that is uh, especially for women stands at about $2.4 million. Other resources that are available for, for women program in the open society include some fellowship programs. And we do also have what we call the new executive fund. That fund supports new executive directors and new formations that are just being established. Um, The kind of funds we give include, we have not worked mostly with our partners. We have worked directly with the national organizations. We rarely do indirect funding through international, except where there is need for, for capacity and that organization can provide. And that was the case when we are supporting the media laws, when they're being formulated. And when we are supporting work on the natural resources and the Petroleum Act and the Petroleum Revenue Management Bill, those were the areas we supported through other actors. But the bulk of our funding go direct to national organizations. We provide capacity building, and capacity building we include either into the proposal, the application that is submitted, or we maintain certain percentage of money within our organizations, and that's when we provide. Uh, we have supported, um, I think, a former director of of SWEN, and we have supported Jacqueline, I think. She was in Morocco somewhere doing some investigative training. And we do also give core support, and core support is really to for the organization to secure their core personnel so that they don't uh, leave the organization, especially when moments when activities are low, but they are present in other meetings, kind of maintain them being present. And we think that is a key role, so we, we pay for that. Um, our grant support is between one to two years. We have just concluded a strategy where we now have scaled it to three years depending on the activity to be done. Um, I would like to go quickly to check in the issue, really the context in South Sudan. South Sudan presents a very polarized and militarized nature of politics, which informs the nature of organizing specific groups. Um, the war has altered also the context in which civil society works. There is political and ethnic affiliation of many civil groups that work in South Sudan. Many civil society groups are founded and staffed along ethnic lines. That makes diversity and inclusion difficult to find and undermines the legitimacy and the credibility of the groups. Government and opposition groups constantly seek to opt civil society groups and sometimes subvert them and turning them the groups to be partisan and creating internal mistrust. Many of the groups 
present themselves as localized grievance-based advocacy groups. The civic groups, I mean the civic space is actually over-legislated and over-regulated, reducing the space for genuine dialogue between the state and civil society. Many times these groups have to seek permission from the national security to be able to, to conduct a meeting. Um, most funding in South Sudan is also shaped by the donors. There's limited independent original thinking. Uh, competition for donor resources has undermined the local collaboration among civil society groups. So one is advancing with this, another one is pulling you back. And there's too much subcontracting of operations to national organizations by the international without considering the need to build in strong groups, organizations in the country. Um, the funding landscape, I think, um, one of the presenters alluded to, there's generally fatigue in funding activities in South Sudan because of the war and the lack of political will from the partners, the peace partners to implementing the agreement. And that every time as we do programming as a national sitting in this, uh, in the donor spaces, you find you have to constantly keep on justifying why we need to continue funding groups in South Sudan because the results which is coming is not very attractive. Available funding tend to be informed by the context and it can actually feed to either the dividers or the connectors depending on how you do your programming. There is huge funding shift to humanitarian support since the onset of the war. Uh, groups are overstretched and lack clear objectives, which further impedes effectiveness and in a context of limited capacity and resources. Now, what are the opportunities? that I would recommend. One is that the peace agreement provides a window of opportunity for civil society groups to reinvent themselves in South Sudan so as they can play more concerted role in peace building and reconstruction effort. This includes the need to overcome internal mistrust for the groups to forge a sense of a unified national purpose. Civil society also needs to engage in new forms of relationship with the government and the citizens. This new engagement should seek to transcend the overriding donor narrative on what is beneficial for South Sudan. It should be rooted on, on original thinking and dialogue with the diverse local stakeholders. There is need for civil society in South Sudan to learn valuable lessons from experiences of civil society organizations in Africa, in other African countries, given the similarity of context and the challenges that will inform the next steps to be able to, to beep up funding in the area. Uh, before I get to the final one, I just would like to be very specific to network experiences in South Sudan. SWEN is one of the network organizations and others that we know. Generally, I think there is a need to kind of rethink how networks will need to operate because currently the way it is being presented is that they seem not to be serving their constituency. You have members, but the members somehow don't get the benefit of being together in the in the, in a network. And that is seen in a way by the fact that sometimes the networks tend to compete for the constituency and the resources together with their members. In some of the networks we have worked with, the secretaries have become a burden to their own members. Finally, there's need, to, there's need for thoughtful grant making to enable civil society to withstand government crackdown, organization, and support growth of middle managers. I thank you all. Great, Don. Thank you so, so very much. I want to do one final quick question uh, for, for both of you, and if you can provide a, <clears throat> a concise uh, response. 
what recommendations would you make to the women's organization? What's like, is what is the number one recommendation that you would make in terms of, you know, um, things that they should do to strengthen their partnerships with donors and to be able to receive more funding? <coughs> Yeah, I think I've learned so much just today about the incredible work some of the women are doing and having events like this is huge and crucial. I would really advocate for women who are leading organizations to network as much as possible and particularly with the INGOs or the intermediate organization as it's been described here today, get to know them, um, you know, stop by, drop by, see and, and provide handouts about, you know, what you're doing. Um, because I think that is a real key to really developing rapport and trust so that when opportunities do come along, they automatically think, oh, I met this incredible woman who's doing all this work on, on justice or gender-based violence issues. This aligns perfectly with what we want to do with this next proposal. Um, so I think that's, that, that is a huge piece for me, is, is developing my own kind of network so I know for each country you know, who, who I can name top 10 women in their organizations doing incredible work um, that I could refer to my other colleagues in the donor community. Great, thank you so much for that, uh, Jennifer. Um, Don, if you had one recommendation, uh, what would it be? Um, my key recommendation to, to the groups would, would fall in three categories. One is the question of relevance. When you, where, how you position yourself within your constituency should really articulate the relevance of the organization. The second thing is you need to, to seek to work on competence and be deliberate about building capacity within the organization. Uh, Credibility is another that we'll work for. Personally, in my work with different groups, I have, I take the gaps, whether in reporting or proposal, as capacity building points. What can really irritate me is issue of integrity. But when report is badly written, and I look at it and it turns out to be a capacity issue, it's different from being an integrity issue. Great. And I would also recommend it to the groups to reach out. They are not getting feedback. The fact is, for example, I work in eight countries and to get all these proposals and give individual feedback, sometimes it's a bit difficult given the capacity that we have, but the door remains open for anyone who would reach out to for very specific questions. Thank Wonderful, you. Don. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much for providing you know these uh, uh, insights. You know, networking, relevant, uh, credibility. Um, you know, as as important things for as women organizations. You know, to think about. Um, as they move forward in, in uh, securing additional funding. I, I'd now like to um, go back to, to Rose. Uh, we were sorry that you got disconnected. And maybe in about you know, five minutes or so, you can wrap up your, your presentation about what you see as, as uh, 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 you know, challenges that you were not able to, to get to earlier. Rose? Thank you very much for the Okay, so Rose, I think you may need to opportunity given to me. Um I would uh, rather go quickly. Um, of course, in the activities that come again, 
Yes, please Emma? continue, Rose. Yes, um, it, it, you may want to turn off your video and just speak because. Uh, Hello, are you getting me? a little messed up, huh? But please continue. Hello. Can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Please continue, Rose. Oh, oh, all right, all right, all right. Uh, I will, I will, okay, thank you, thank you. I will go quickly on the challenges at the... Okay, I think that our uh, connection uh, with uh, Rose is not uh, uh, working um, so so well. So um, we're uh, we're sorry about that. Maybe she's going to reconnect while we do uh, move on to the next section, which is to be able to uh, answer some of the questions that we've gotten from the the listening uh, uh, audience. Um, uh, let me start with uh, this question. There's a, a, a question or a comment about uh, that says if proposal writing and all of the other ways of sourcing funds have not worked as they were initially intended, is it not time that we start thinking about alternative forms of supporting local led initiatives? Uh, so the question is, is sort of, you know, focusing on, you know, you know, are there different ways? Can we think out of the box about you know, different forms of, of, of uh, or methods of funding uh, for local organizations? Uh, who would like to take a stab at that? Uh, maybe Jennifer, Don? Um, yeah, I, I would add it. I think, thank you for the question. I think it's an important question. And I think we are just diving deep on how we can be a little bit more agile with our, fun, our funding mechanisms and really amplify those efforts. I heard a lot from the Peace Women uh, today that, you know, really building capacity was a big, important part of their funding. Um, and I think one example that really worked well um, back in 2015 when I was in Papua New Guinea was Counterpart International was uh, the, the sub uh, INGO, um, but they were working with very local women organizations who obviously just didn't have internet connection to even apply for the funding or machines to write the proposals. So they took a step back from the initial kind of requirements of the program and said, no, we really need to dedicate time and notified us as the donor to say, you know, we're not gonna get started in six months. We actually need to probably take more time to build their capacity. So having those very frank, honest conversations between the sub and the intermediate is really helpful to say, we're not ready to really start programming. We just really need to get our own organizational capacity together. And I think having those conversations, we could be a little bit more flexible to give uh, the women themselves and their partners opportunities to organize within their own um, structure a little bit better. So we are working on it and it is difficult um, under, you know, kind of government institutions and structures to be as flexible and agile as we need to be at times. But thank you for the question. Great. Thank you so very much, um, you know, for that, Jennifer. Um, what about uh, Jacqueline, Julia, Josephine, or Rose, you know, what, you know, do you have any thoughts about what might, you know, some more flexible ways of funding might might look like? Or, you know, that you think would work um, in your context? Um, hello. Yes, Rose. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, yes. I would um, uh, recommend that if the, the networking within women uh, is strengthened, to be able now to, 
to to to, to propose and um, write the proposal in in, in, a, in a combination of uh, proposal writing it would be good leaving it not to each and every hand to write on separate notes and the other person on the separate notes it will give like a confusion to the donors it is also very important to see the roles are played uh, within uh, who is playing what and and uh, who is playing what and where it will bring uh, a direct uh, support and it will also enable the donors to, to to know you clearly and it will show a clear picture on what you do this is what i can put Great, thank you, Rose. It sounds like I, I think part of what I heard you say is that maybe some of the, the different women's organizations that are working, you know, specialized in different areas can come together and do a joint, you know, um, proposal uh, and sort of, sort of build on some of the differing capabilities that you would have in, in the different uh, organizations. Um, you know, what do the rest of you think about that? Uh, Jacqueline, Julia? Um, Josephine? Um, I think what Ross has said is, uh, is in place, like trying to organize people who are already in networks to apply for a proposal as a group. I'll also say that uh, um, some donors, including UN Women, I think they have done some mapping of local women organization working on peace building. Mm -hmm. and also on uh, issues of access to justice and human rights. So probably it will be good to have a conversation with these uh, organizations who have done already the mapping, which include, I think, CARE. And also we have uh, USAID with the Women Monthly Forum. We have the Women's Coalition. So there are already existing networks that are there. And then uh, not leaving out the constituencies and the networks at the local level, uh, we may need to, to do more of assessing the local networks at the state level because that's often left out. And we can have a call for proposal that should include them. I think one experience I had when we applied for the care proposal, which I think could also help some donors, is that uh, care sent out the proposal. Different women applied, including the ones that they are already having in existence. And then instead of just saying this is what we are calling for and your proposal matches it, they took us back to rewrite the proposal and having people's views incorporated in what they are thinking of uh, implementing. So those who are shortlisted, they were able to reshape the proposal. And that makes it easier for people also when they will be implementing, they'll feel like it's part of what they contributed to and implementation becomes easier, especially for smaller women's organizations. And it also becomes a learning process for them to understand what are the things that donors look into. For example, it becomes part of the training to know what is a log frame and what are the outcomes, what are the inputs and, you know, these kinds of things help the women's organizations to start thinking and also like building their capacity in understanding how uh, donors want proposals to be written. So I think uh, probably having a conversation with these major donors of how their processes are and involving uh, women at the earlier stages before awarding, uh, you know, uh, contracts is really important. Great. Thank you so very much for that. Uh, keeping on this uh, same issue, uh, another comment uh, uh, that we have uh, received says, uh, the capacity issues is quite complex. And I think women's organizations should clearly come out to indicate if they are networks of volunteers or established organizations. There is obviously a need for office space and at least uh, the technical team should be updated with key funding requirements because funders, especially the intermediaries, fear risking too much to a group without uh, proper uh, uh, credibility. Um, any sort of responses uh, maybe from uh, Jacqueline, Julia, Josephine, Rose on that comment? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, maybe I could uh, give a few comments. 
Yes. I am um, sorry. Um, I think one of the things I've found is that um, I believe it's true that credibility certainly is a key issue, but I also get the sense that sometimes donors hold women's organizations to a different standard than they do hold men's organizations. When it comes to networking, it's important as, as an organization, I can say for sure, one of the things, we are a membership organization. At our formation, we drew together women uh, lawyers who are working across different sectors, and we had an initial membership strength of 66 members. But if we do not get the funds to be able to adequately engage our members, then we get ourselves in a cycle where we're not able to carry out the objectives for which we were intended to. So I think um, certainly, uh, it's important to, to, to continue to remain accountable to your constituency, but I hope donors also understand the very real challenges that are there when you do not have funding and you cannot effectively organize and effectively engage the, all the members as they would like to be engaged. I think that's Great. what I'd say for them. Julia, thank you so very much for that. Um, Don, did you want to weigh in? Yes. And uh, I think the issue of capacity, it is also about us, the donors, in sense, um, sometimes we, we invest too much on our own, saying we want to be secure, you put digital security and many other things, and then you forget the constituency. And we forget that it's actually, that is the loose end. If information can leak out from there, you can also easily be victim. And therefore, my notion of capacity building, which is somehow what we have adapted in, a, in the open society, is we call it thoughtful grant making. A thoughtful grant making would take into account the aspects of capacity building. And the capacity building here, we look at it at about three levels. Staff development, so that they are competent in the areas they are trying to do. And we do also learn to see that there's an oversight in that organization. And that's when we, we get uh, to do board development. And we need you to have a working space that is very enabling. It, it becomes a challenge. For example, when you find your partner is, has to walk to an internet cafe to send you a report. And in many cases, they can actually forget the, the, the flash disk there. And so what you call confidential is no more confidential. You're actually exposed. And these are things you can actually negotiate. Uh, and that's why for, for us in the open society, we, we don't make call for proposal. It is open throughout the year. And so if you don't get feedback, you can always come back and ask what is happening. And so it is like, not, it's not written on the, it's not cast on stone, the proposal. It can always be discussed. Thank you. Great, thank you, Don, especially for sharing your definition of capacity building, because we have another comment here that says, can we interrogate the notion of capacity building? Um, and uh, the person goes on to say, you know, I fear that focusing on this too much places the burden outside of the donor and locates it on the uh, women who are already burdened and trying to operate in a difficult context, as you've talked about, Don. Um, what should do donors do uh, to shift this problem? I think, Andrew, you might have some thoughts on this? Um, I, it was a little bit in relation to the, to the previous conversation, but I think it's relevant for this as well. I mean, one of the things I think sometimes we get stuck on is that we fund organizations. And, you know, even in the US context, with, within the activist space, a lot of times funders are funding individuals or individuals that are leading movements. And so I think one of the ways we can kind of change and, and, and reimagine is, is not to worry about the organization that you know, a, a woman leader has, but to fund the, the woman as an individual who then leads a network or who leads a movement and then I think that also helps with the capacity building where a lot of times I think we want smaller organizations to look like an INGO. And so we try to build their capacity up in a very specific 
set of ways because we have the INGO model where there are different ways of organizing work um, that we should also sort of respect and fund. Great, thank you so much for that, Andrew. On a different uh, note, uh, a comment here, uh, one of the early uh, questions, comments that we got is the following. Ending violence against women is vital uh, for the case of South Sudan. My question is due to COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, GBV is on high increase uh, to women and, and, and school going girls. And in this uh, point, how are, um, you know, or what are ways that we're going to help girls since um, schools are, are closed? Uh, perhaps Mary or Jacqueline or Julia, Josephine or Rose may want to address that question. Um, I'm going to respond like this. Um, on, our, on our part, uh, before schools closed down, we used to work with GBV clubs in six schools. So when the schools closed, we have continued to work with the club members, a few of them that we can get hold of. Um, we've done orientation for them on COVID-19 guidelines and its impact on women and girls and, and more reflection has been on GBV. So we, in, in each of the four schools, we identified five um, GBV club members through their patrons to, to continue moving in their villages um, to, to speak with their schoolmates, to speak with their classmates on what the experiences are during this period. And also to, to, to meet once in a week, they have come up with a drama which is run on the radio. Um, so each school comes up with a drama on COVID-19 and GBV and its impact, and then this is run on the radio. That's one of the ways we've tried to reach out to um, children who are out of school due to COVID-19. Um, I, maybe there will be no time, but I just wanted to say some of the experience that we, we have with the, the capacity of organizations. Um, we've worked with one donor that has supported us since 2014. We are now going to a period where we, uh, there's something they are now calling leading from the south. We are going to sit on their board leadership. So those partners that they fund are going to rotate yearly to sit on their board leadership to make decisions and also to, to, to just uh, prepare proposals together. Uh, and I think for funding to be flexible, also let me add it here that we need to increase the administrative costs from 7% to at least 20%. There we will have a lot of flexibility to develop uh, uh, our small organizations to something better. And also funding should cater for the context, always changing context. Like we have our donor UN Trust Fund, when they gave us 500,000, they said due to COVID-19, you add 40% to cater for the changing context. I think that is something very, very useful that I wanted to just leave here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, um, uh, Josephine. And thank you, you know, everyone you know, for, for sharing um, your questions. Uh, I think now we're going to hear from Lillian, um, who is the head of the South Sudanese Women's Empowerment uh, uh, Network and, and the organizer of uh, um, this event. And as we hear her comments, I also want to uh, share with her uh, the final question that we have in our Q&A for her to respond to. And it says, thank you to Swen for organizing this important event. And thank you to Lillian, you are such a visionary leader. Uh, Juba is hosting the Sudan peace process 
and there is an impasse with regard to the negotiations on South Kordofan uh, between the GOS and the SPLM North led by um, Abdel Aziz um, Al Hilo. And I think that there is a need for building bridges. Are South Sudanese women's organizations playing any role in this process? And um, you know, can you also provide an update on initiatives to support South Sudanese women, former combatants who went through DDR? So I give you that question and you know, final remarks uh, from Lillian and the South Sudanese Women's Empowerment Network. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris, uh, for this introduction. And I would like to thank all of you, uh, the panelists, the speakers, the presenters, for today's event. Um, you, our contribution is really highly, highly appreciated. And uh, we have seen some scary statistics from Mary's presentations. Um, and we also uh, got an understanding to what degree is the violence against women impacting women in South Sudan. And we also were able to see the results of the ongoing study uh, that we are doing with Dr. Morris. And we also heard from the women peacemakers on the ground. And I really wanted to thank you so much, Rose. And what happened to Rose today is an example, a life example of the challenges that the women's civil society face on the ground. Uh, internet connections. Uh, even this event was supposed to be uh, in person, but we were not able to do it due to COVID-19. But I appreciate the challenges that women have to go through it just to be online and to be heard. So thank you so much, Rose, and thank you to all women peacemakers from South Sudan coming today and uh, sharing your experiences. Right now, as we speak, uh, there is more increase on the communal violence. Um, those of you who are in Juba and those of you who are following the news, you might be seeing a lot of um, news coming about the increase of violence. And the increase of violence actually, um, uh, the increase of violence is actually make it more um, important to support the women's civil society of Russia at this particular moment. So they can be able to mitigate some of this violence at their very uh, local uh, context. So if we are to repeat the study that has been done with the Global Women Institute today, I am sure the numbers will be doubled, not, if not even tripled. Because women, the situation in South Sudan is very, very, very not good. Uh, just recently, the, yesterday, the central bank uh, announced it's um, run out of funds so and there's increase of violence so it's a very new country but yet the challenges are, are really really very much so it, it's a very difficult environment for the women's uh, civil society uh, to work on so um, but we're we have hope and the, we have hope when looking forward for two more important documents that might come out from this gathering that we have the the outcome of the crop uh, research study that you have seen the survey going on, we have a lot of hope in the outcome of that mm -hmm. because it's focusing on um, increasing funding to women organizations. It's focusing on how to strengthen relationship between local women peacemakers and international funders. And we're also hoping from this study that we are doing, so we will be able to come up with a capacity building initiative. And I really want to thank Osia uh, for supporting a lot of women organizations, including Swain on the ground, to be working. So with that, I wanted to thank Dr. Nada Ali for the question that you asked. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Jane also. She is a faculty from uh, University of Fordham. These two women, uh, gender specialists, um, work influence a lot of work that Suen is doing. To answer your question um, in terms of the role that the South Sudanese Women Organization can be able to uh, um, influence the DDR process, I just wanted, from my own perspective, the DDR process in South Sudan is basically maybe dead, the process dead by now, because lack of funding, lack of instability, lack of conflict, and, and of course, lack of misuse of funds. There's so much funds before that was 
channel toward the DDR, and, and, and as you might know, uh, the situation with that. And um, we hope, we hope South Sudan will straighten itself and stand up again and um, with the current economic crisis so that people can be able to focus more on the development. As mentioned with, by one of the speakers before, people now in South Sudan are focusing more on the basic needs of life. Uh, we have conflict going on, we have flooding going on, we have COVID-19 going on. So there are so much people are dealing with now. So the focus probably right now is the basic needs uh, of life. But with that, I would like to conclude by uh, thanking all of you once again. And I really wanted to thank the Kraken Institute for initiating the Women Peacemakers program that inspired a lot of women, including myself, to put this program together. I would like to thank um, Dr. Morris um, for the generous support that she's been giving. I would like to thank also the South Sudanese Women Intellectual Forum and a special thanks to Skylar and Diviani. And Skylar and Diviani, can you please turn your video on so we can uh, say thank you to you. And I would like to ask everybody to please put your hand together for these two young ladies. Without them, this event would not be really possible. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for with the support you give. And before I conclude, I also wanted to ask all the panelists and the speakers uh, to put their uh, cameras on. So if we can have a screen uh, zoomed for, uh, with everybody, do you think we can have that, Skylar? That all the speakers, all the panelists, all the presenters, Sure, yeah, I think you'll have to stop sharing your screen okay. and then we'll be able to see everyone, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much, all of you. So I think that is really very good to see all of you here. I'm just gonna take um, a screenshot of that. Thank you. And I hope to see you in the um, next event. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll be sharing um, the recording on our, um, our website and we'll also send out an email with the recording to everybody um, and also the survey link. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Masara. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.